Okay, so what I'd like to do is to talk about grading metals. So I will do some fairly basic things quite a lot through this talk, so please bear with me. But so, I mean, the ultimate question is what is grading? It's a way to assess condition, and that kind of leads us to a way uh, to determine value. So uh, I'd like to start off with this slide, which was shown a couple of months ago, uh, courtesy of uh, uh, Peter and John. Um, and it highlights some of the differences between um, US collecting and European collecting. Peter and John did a very good uh, uh, talk uh, a couple months ago on comparison between uh, the US and European um, grading. Um, the one thing that it didn't cover is grading, which I'll try to address in this presentation. So the question is, why grade? Well, turns out there's tons of collectibles, paintings, cars, books, Hollywood memorabilia, et cetera, but only a handful have quantitative grading. Uh, diamonds, rubies, baseball cards, comic books, and movie posters. And the question is, you know, why do we need to put a number to a grade? Well, it's a metric to assess comparative value, which means we can ultimately uh, treat what's being graded as a commodity for investment purposes. So that uh, if somebody wants to, uh, say, put a portfolio of Morgan dollars uh, in high grades, they can do it. Uh, another reason for quantitative grading is to authenticate it, uh, which is incredibly important considering the amount of uh, counterfeits that are coming. And it's also led to bragging rights, i.e.g. The, um, uh, the registry sets. Disadvantages, well, not everybody agrees on a grade, and I'll get more into that. And uh, if you have it graded by a third party, they put it in a chunk of plastic. And while it protects the object, it's hard to uh, see some of the things. You can't see the edge easily. And quite bluntly, looking at it in a slab reduces the experience. You can't quite get all the luster. You can't quite get it at uh, very, very um, narrow angles, such as when you're kind of looking at it almost edgewise. So um, let's go a little further on to uh, grading. Uh, I want to talk about the development of grading and um, a little bit of history there. Uh, initially, grading was descriptive. So through the mid-19th uh, century, uh, there were only a few qualitative uh, terms used, good, fine, uncirculated, and proof referring to uh, how it was made. And opinions varied widely, and there were no defined standards for grading a coin or a metal. So each dealer and collector chose his or her own standards. Um, and age and rarity affected the grade. And to quote Doug Bird, um, one of the noted copper people, uh, you know, if it was your coin, obviously it had a one grade higher uh, grade than uh, anybody else would uh, think of. Um, but eventually, uh, we started getting a spectrum of descriptive or what I call adjectival grades, going from poor uh, all the way up to uh, gem uncirculated. Um, I think there's a gem brilliant. And then a quantitative scale came into being, uh, what we call the Sheldon scale. And the Sheldon scale was presented in uh, Dr. William Sheldon's book, Early American Sense. And in the book, he looked at a, a small subset of coins, specifically the 1894 large cent coin. And he looked at tons of them and found that ones that were in, at that time in 1949, you could buy a 1794, uh, ignoring varieties, uh, large cent, in that was really lousy in poor condition for a dollar. One that was in good condition, you'd spend about four bucks. A very fine one, you'd spend about 20. And he found that, you know, you'd have to spend as much as $70 to find one that was perfect. And from that came uh, the various uh, grades. Uh, and Sheldon quite wisely pointed out that rarity was a separate consideration. 
So the pricing on the uh, coins that he showed here were not for ultra rarities, uh, things that were like R7s or things like that, that only like the, uh, the Jefferson head or the starred um, cents. Um, but unfortunately, the Sheldon scale uh, didn't stay with a linear scale between price and uh, the adjectival grade. It was initially linear, but within a few years that failed. Today, as you go up in, pri in grade, uh, the price is exponential, but it's not exponential numerically. It's exponential according to its uh, descriptive grade. So on average, and if you look at the, um, the gray circles here, that's for the 85 US typeset that ignores modern coins and uh, statehood quarters. But basically what that says is that you go from, on average, from a, if you wanna buy a coin in good four, but you, you'd prefer one in VG condition, you're gonna spend about 75% more. If you wanted it in 12, you'd another 75%. And it's actually quite an amazingly good fit on this 85 coin typeset. Uh, I then actually looked at uh, various uh, type coins within the large cent and found that yes, the same relationship held, the slopes were different. Um, and that had to do things like uh, classic heads had a higher slope. And I think that's a rarity condition. But anyway, um, as you go up to uh, mint state, it's somewhat exponential. Uh, when you get to the really high mint states, uh, the graph fails because the people that the amounts that people will spend for like a MS 67 is astronomical because you've got two people with tons of money um, and they'll spend anything. Uh, anyway, what happened with the Sheldon scale is it was adopted for US coins. And uh, in 1977, the ANA came out with grading stands for, standards for US coins and the numerical and intermediate grades were clearly defined with ele with illustrations, and they also um, added proof grades. So um, from there, what happened was um, we saw the evolution of third-party grading. In 1979, the ANA started certifying coins, and that turned into ANAX. Uh, 86, uh, it really changed when PCGS came into being, followed by NGC. Uh, there are a lot of other grading companies, but uh, they pale in comparison. So with PCGS, what happened was that they started encapsulating coins and nowadays metals in plastic slabs. The nice thing is that it provided an independent assessment of, of grades that hopefully would be accepted as expert opinion. Uh, however, the grading standards have varied over the years. It's relatively consistent for Morgan dollars it's much less consistent for early copper. And I was one of the questions I'd have that we could talk about later is for people who've seen metals graded, is there consistency? Um, also, the perceived value of a coin or metal seems to have an impact. And specifically, I've illustrated the Adams Carter French Class 3, 18 to 4 silver dollar. Eight, nine, in 1989, PCA. PCGS graded that as an EF45. Um, 12 years later, PCG, PCGS graded that exact coin, no changes, as an AU58. And like the uh, Quiller 1804 example, today it would likely end up being graded as a low mint state. Same coin, didn't change at all. Uh, also, uh, multiple resubmissions uh, people will do to try to get higher grades. And uh, for example, um, a uh, 1793 Sheldon II large cent, which was graded by EAC as a, uh, a fine 12, PCGS graded it initially as a VG10 details because of a couple of edge bumps. It was resubmitted 
PCGS, probably some other people looked at it. Oh, it's a G6, clean. And then it was resubmitted and came out as a VG10. <laughs> the exact same coin with absolutely no change in surface condition. I mentioned EAC grading. Um, and that's the early American coppers. They have very strict standards. And the standards have been virtually unchanged from Sheldon's era. Um, and it's codified in uh, the book that I show here, the grading guide for early American copper coins, and it covers colonials, half cents, and large cents. Uh, one of the things that we found by looking at how EAC grades compared to NGC and PCGS grades, uh, the graph actually shows again on this uh, on a scale that typically uh, NGC and PCGS grade the same coin about one grade higher than what uh, the EAC people will do. Um, but it varies, as you can see. Here's a comparison on the left, uh, you see uh, the ANA uh, grading guide, and you can see basically uh, medium to low resolution images. Uh, the EAC copper uh, guide has very, very high images, uh, very good quality printing. Uh, you can now go online, both the NGC and here I show PCGS photo grade um, of the same uh, variety coin. And if you look, you see um, the uh, EAC uh, 20 coin, this one right here, uh, has basically the same uh, details image as what PCGS would call a 30. I'd also mention that EAC standards gives a double grade because they'll give a details grade and then a, uh, a net grade. Um, for example, if you had a coin with uh, VF35 sharpness that had too many circulation marks, what the, uh, uh, peop the uh, Morgan people would call bag marks, it might be net graded as a 25. So you'd see a, a grade of 35 over 25. I'd also, I mentioned uh, ANAX used to net grade, but no longer does that. Um, here, um, I thought I'd show European grading systems and European grading systems are very descriptive um, rather than numeric. Um, the Scandinavian system is kind of interesting um, because the poorer the uh, coin, the, the larger the number. Um, I also find it amusing that uh, the lowest condition uh, for, in France, uh, Acebo, uh, you know, we would not translate a, a good coin as quite beautiful into the U.S., but uh, I'll argue that with my wife, whose degree is in French. Um, okay, what are the advantages of grading? Well, detailed grading um, is useful for things that can be effectively graded by hopefully community accepted experts, people that we all agree are good. For example, Bob Grellman in the early copper community is pretty much considered someone who is very good at grading. Mark Borkhart, who uh, works for Heritage is another one who is very, very good and very consistent that people accept. Um, detailed grading is useful for pieces that are minted in large quantities and can that can be compared and show a wide span of condition grades, for example, Morgan silver dollars. Um, it's useful for pieces that are seen as an investment because grading is an important factor in determining value. Um, and as because they are considered an investment, um, you know, uh, there's a broad base for US coin collectors. And so, as I said, that what grade you give is a key variable to its respective value, which is why some people will resubmit multiple times in the hope of going from like a, um, an MS-63 uh, to an MS-64 can be thousands or tens of thousands of dollars for rarer coins in value. Um, and as a result, grading and slabbing is beneficial for U.S. and, um, you know, um, late uh, 19th century and newer foreign coins. Well, the qu which brings the real question, should we slab metals? Um, one of the problems with slabbing is that most of the time you can't see the edge of the metal. And edge marks um, 
are important, for example, to determine uh, how old the thing is. Um, the uh, Monet de Paris uh, medals have edge marks uh, after the into the 18th century, 19th century. Um, additionally, um, since there may not be a disputed expert opinion on the originality of a piece, sometimes it's going to be looked at by multiple people. And so you've got to have it out of the slab to really do the job. So if it's a slab metal, you got to take it out of the slab and resubmit. Um, uh, Renaissance metals, for example, are often seen as individual pieces of art. I mean, one of the reasons I collect uh, metals is for the artistic value rather than the monetary value. And so metal collectors really want a natural view, view of the metal, which is much less a concern on coins. And to quote Peter Ployce, you know, if you had the Mona Lisa, would you put it in a plastic bag um, so you could display it at home and not get dust on it? So that raises the question that we'll discuss in a little bit, should we slab metals? And along that line, you know, is grading metals worthwhile? Well, um, it's not very useful for pieces where the originality is hard to judge, even for this group, which isn't quite knowledgeable. Um, pieces where the initial um, minting is, um, the quality is not clear. I mean, if you've got a cast metal, sometimes it's not a really good job. And it's not useful for uh, pieces where only a handful have been made so that you don't have a wide range of conditions. Um, additionally, you know, as I said, proof of originality sometimes is difficult. And for some pieces, even experts can't tell the age and originality. For example, the Frondoffer forgeries of German Renaissance medals. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, these metals were often cast and struck in small quantities. Um, the initial quality often varies for these and other metals, and many of them are hold in their first years, which uh, when you send in a hold coin to a third party grader, you know that it's come, gonna come back as a detailed coin because, oh, it was hold. But you know, the hole is sometimes it was intended to be worn. Um, and another problem with metals, and particularly Renaissance metals, um, is only a handful of examples come on the market at any time. And the, um, the price difference can be significantly um, variable on grade. And uh, if there's only a handful of pieces, rough grades may be sufficient. Some final thoughts. Coins and metals are different. Um, coins are relatively uniform and large quantities and do not vary much over production of, in decades. I mean, if you look, for example, the 1793 half cent, uh, they made 35,000 of them. Um, how many metals are made in quanti in tens of thousands? The next year, um, the production of the US half cent went up by a factor of 10. Um, and uh, in 1998, the year that MCA was founded, the U.S. minted just at the Philadelphia Mint, five billion. So yeah, you've got a lot of uh, quantity. So yeah, you can do some very exact grading. Whereas metals, I mean, the Libertas Americana uh, only had a few hundred made. So how, you know, how should we grade metals? You know, should we grade metals? How should we grade them? One thought is, if we want to, should we use the same concept as ANA, uh, EAC, or European standards, or what? I mean, for example, could the EAC grading guide or photo guide be used as a rough comparison of, with respect to wear characteristics? Um, and um, another problem is, and I don't think it should, but unfortunately it does, should rarity affect grade? It influences price definitely, and demand is a much greater driver. For example, if you look at the price of an S, uh, 1909 SVDB cent, you're going to be spending close to $1,000 in 
in uh, in good to very good condition versus uh, the price of a half cent, which is much rarer um, and uh, in any condition. And then should provenance affect grade? Uh, again, it's more of a pricing issue. But for example, uh, the uh, Indian peace medal, and we've already seen that for the 1804 silver dollars, value affects grade. So um, I'd like to open up uh, the discussion, you know, giving all of the given all of this, is grading of metals something we want to encourage or discourage? If we want to encourage a grading standard, what should we do? Should we use existing standards as a model? Should we create our own? Thank you. Um,